Hey, guys, on, let me get my coffee. All right, it's been a while for the live stream. That's been a combination of uh, just not having time with um, <laughs> a lot going on. Um, and I forgot to bring it up, man, but uh, it's been a quite a busy summer. Plus, I got a new phone that and it'll do for a few months uh, until I see something else going on here. But basically, I figured I'd show uh, some books I picked up in the last couple months and just do a little talking and stuff if uh, people were out there. I mean, are there people that still like want to talk about comics instead of the drama and stuff that's out there? I don't know. I don't know. We'll find out. But uh, it's been a crazy, crazy couple weeks. Hey, Matthew Rasko is out there. Yeah, I like this phone. I can see it a little bit better. Man, the screen's just big enough to where I can actually see some comments. But anyway, uh, let's give it a chance for people to pop in here and stuff, and I'll get to the comics here. But uh, it's been an interesting summer, man. Hey, it's Louie. Hey, Studio Fitness, Louie. Yeah, what's up, Lou? What's going on, man? Here we go. We got people coming in now. But um, anyway, it's been a crazy summer, man. Last month, I saw Pat Benatar in concert, and uh, a nice little surprise was they had a band that I loved in the 80s and kind of still follow around, uh, driving and crying. I probably talked about some of this stuff. Um, and then uh, had a bit of a social life here going on. It's just been fantastic. I might talk about that one day. Uh, I might actually have somebody on the show. Hey, Matthew, that's what I'm talking about, man. My summer here, man. Thanks for asking. Summer's been summer's been awesome. Uh, work has sucked, but uh, it's been more than balanced out with um, a lot of stuff going on and just having a really good summer when, you know, basically when I'm not working. But um, then uh, this past Friday, uh, I didn't bring the drumstick up. I went and saw the B-52s with a friend of mine uh, in Roanoke, Virginia. Got home about 1.30, didn't get back until 3. That's why I didn't do a live show yesterday. Um, yesterday, I was just a zombie. But I went and saw the B-52s. And we were right up against the little stage that was there. It was a small show for them. About 3,500 people were there. Go check out my Facebook and my Instagram. It's uh, Howler Mouse. And uh, there should be links on my channel page, right? Hey, Matilda Gothica is there. What's going on? Nice. All kinds of people coming on. But at the concert, it was really awesome because it was like right there. I mean, I mean, you could reach out and touch them. I was in front of Kate Pearson. Fred was coming over, and I got to watch Cindy dance. And uh, for the encore, she took off her shoes, so I got to see Cindy dancing uh, with her shoes off. And if you know the B-52s, you know that's a big deal. But the greatest thing was is that um, uh, Fred gave me his drumstick that he played cowbell with. All right, I got a picture like on my Facebook link should be there should be a link to my Facebook on my channel page, and then my Instagram I'm Howler Mouse. Uh, my settings are set to private because things got nuts on there. Um, uh, a couple years ago, and I'm just preferred that way. But yeah, you can see me with the drumstick. Had a fantastic time. Now, a few of the books. We've got some people in here. I'm going to move on to the books. Some of the book. I'm going to show some movies too. Some of the books I got, I may have already shown in other videos. But uh, you know, this is all for fun. And then on the 25th of August uh, this month, uh, we're going to a comic book convention in Salem. We're only going to stay. There's about three or four of us going. I'll only be staying about an hour and a half to two hours. So we'll see what I can find there. Matthew Rasko, today marks my second day going into Terrificon. I'm planning on getting a picture with Roger Stern. That is cool, man. Uh, I'd really like to see that, Matthew. So uh, leave a link on how or send me a message or something on how I can uh, see that. Hey, love the Pat. Hit me with your best shot. Yeah, I've been, yeah. Pat Benatar is a tiny thing, and her show was awesome. She did the hits and stuff. We had a great time. I also have pictures of that uh, on my Facebook page. Um, to you know where we went last month but seeing driving and crying was really a treat because they were not advertised uh when i saw them hey brian craig i want to thank you for uh intro me to the goon hey man my pleasure the goon is a solid fun book man that little that little that little depression era uh, it's little rascals um meets ec horror comics um uh, you know world that the, the goon lives in is just fantastic Oh, come on. Come on back. Sorry about the finger, guys. And yeah, that's right. I had a couple more comments there. But uh, moving on, I did a video talking about rereading this book, but I'm just going to go ahead and show it so we can get through the stack here. But uh, I found this book. This is Batman uh, 213 from 1969. It's a bunch of reprints. This celebrated Batman's 30th anniversary back in the day. And I read this comic, half of it. Uh, when I was like about four, this was part of a stack of uh, coverless comics. 
Hey, I could link you to my Facebook for the con photos, although my Harvey Bullock cosplay may be a bit disheveled. No, man. Harvey Bullock is supposed to be disheveled. Matthew, I want to be linked to that. Hey, Von, Dr. Von Chilla is here. Thanks, man. So anyway, um, oh, how are you? I don't know if they're talking to me, but if Matilda, if you are talking to me and not in, in, in person in the chat, I'm, I'm doing pretty good, man. I'm getting jacked up on my Starbucks here. Anyway, with this book, this was part of a stack of coverless comic books when I was about four that it's read and reread. And it took me a while to really kind of track this down because on the top of each page, it says giant Batman. So I always thought it was like a special or uh, a, maybe an annual or something. There's all kinds of little things that in the seventies, they would bring out hundred page giant, 80 page giants, a bunch of reprint series. But the biggest thing in this was uh, it had the story, uh, the origin of Clayface, and it had uh, the red hood in it. And the Red Hood book, I tried, I remember the story well, so I tried to track it down, and this was originally in Detective in the 50s, so that's, all kinds of things kind of threw me off. Plus, it wasn't like I was really spending 100% of my time trying to track this book down, but I always kept an eye out for it. Found it on eBay. This is the most I spent on a book. It wasn't bad. Matthew, the original Clayface. Yeah. <coughs> the original Clayface. But, uh... But I, you know, I found it on eBay on a whim of all things. Uh, it took me about a week to get it. I was still able to haggle the price down. You know, they had to make an offer on there. So really glad to find that. So, uh, yeah, this is one off the bucket list. Um, I'm doing this thing now where I'm seeing the bands I want to see. Uh, they're getting older. I'm getting older. I'm finally tracking down the comics because, uh, you know, I'm not buying Marvel comics. I'm buying very few modern comics and uh, all sorts of things like that. All right, so moving on now, nothing really in here is going to blow you away. A lot of this stuff is from a dollar bin. There's a uh, antique shop around here where you can rent out a lot inside of it, a little space. And some dude has bought a 12,000 uh, issue comic book collection, and he's slowly going through it, and he's bringing in tons of boxes here about once or twice a month, and they're all dollar books. I've already done a video where I found the good shit the first time around. He's brought in probably about six more, well, I don't know, four more boxes of stuff. And I might may or may not have shown some of that stuff. And uh, one of the things I've kind of picked up um, to move this along here is uh, kind of filling in runs and stuff. In the 90s, Valiant came out. And I highly recommend the 90s Valiant comics with Jim Shooter steering the ship. That stuff was great. Pretty much from, uh, you know, Magnus number zero, the Solar to Exo Man of War, Harbinger, things like that, going all the way up to their big crossover of Unity, right? But one of the books I kind of liked was about a guy named Jack Boniface. John Boniface, I haven't read this in years, but I got about 28 issues out of the 43. Uh, this is helping complete the run. Uh, a couple copies of number one and things like that, but was uh, Shadow Man. Uh, Shadow Man came in there. I think Actually, I think Steve Englehart ended up doing the first issue, I think. He debuted in Exo Man of War number four. He, this is a dude that's a, a jazz. Uh, he plays jazz on the saxophone in New Orleans. He's a musician. And one night he gets bit by a spider alien uh, in Exo Man of War. And uh, then he finds this mask, this Mardi Gras mask, uh, just sitting there, you know, floating around, you know, the wind blowing it around the streets of New Orleans or something like that. And he starts feeling like possessed and everything like that. Mind the comics is here. What's up, brother? And uh, so all of a sudden, it's like he just feels energized and sort of possessed and everything like that. And he's a creature of the night. Steve Englehart he ended up leaving Valiant and he went to the Ultraverse through Malibu and ended up doing Nightman. And he was doing the things in Nightman that he supposedly wanted to do in Shadow Man. So he says Nightman is more of a creature of the night. So, uh, yeah, just a few things. Uh, I think issue one and issue eight are the hot books of this series because uh, I think issue eight had the first appearance of Master Dark. But, you know, with um, things going on with Valiant, uh, who knows? Who knows? So, yeah. But, uh, yeah, some good stuff in here. I love this cover. Really like that cover. Some nice, cool stuff, man. Just some solid, fun reads. Now, a guy named Bob Hall came on that book. And Bob Hall, I kind of like. He has a really cool structure of drama. Yeah, Matthew, I miss Malibu Comics has some good stuff. That Ultraverse, I really wish I could have took off. For you guys that don't know... Malibu helped uh, bring Image into the fold, which was the artist coming. Hey, what's up, Paulo? I mean, we got all kinds of people popping in now. And then, uh, for what, you know, for several reasons, Image ended up leaving, becoming their own thing. Then Malibu started the Ultraverse, which was the writers. 
you had James Robinson in there, Steve Englehart, Steve Gerber, just a lot of, you know, just a lot of cool people coming in out with books and stuff. And uh, the Strangers, Steve Englehart had a book called The Strangers, which uh, was had the spirit of the root of his 70s uh, Avengers run, in my opinion. Okay, so something else got for a dollar. It's not going to blow you away, but this is TR TSR Worlds. I was being into D&D &D in the 80s. I was 13, and everybody I played D&D &D with, my crew, they were from 17 to probably about 35. So I was like this kid hanging out about twice a month, staying up all night, eating chips, bullshitting with a bunch of older guys. I have a full collection of Steve Gerber Sludge from Balamu Comics. And I'm, yeah, I'm wanting to check it out. They got probably like about the first six, six or eight issues of Steve Gerber's Sludge. Now, I'll get it just because it's Steve Gerber. Steve Gerber is awesome. To me, Steve Gerber is the original Grant Morrison to a certain extent. Uh, maybe even the original Alan Moore for America in a way with his mind trips. That might be a better way to do it. The guy used a lot of metaphors and, and things like that. But TSR Worlds, um, I love the Forgotten Realms book that came out. TSR Worlds got licensed by DC, and they actually had two, three people who worked on the D&D &D stuff, the real stuff come in, Jim Grubb and some guys who worked on these books. But the biggest thing was is Forgotten Realms, uh, a book that I love. I had a guy named Rags Morales uh, come on there on the book. It was like, I think, his first series. Guy went on to do uh, Identity Crisis and stuff, got big there for a while. Just fun stuff, but uh, this is where they brought in Spelljammer, but they had a couple of D&D &D books and uh, some uh, Forgotten Realms characters in here. I read very little Malibu. A friend of mine had a couple of issues of Solitaire. Yeah, I mean, there was something for everybody there, man. The fact that they uh, Prime was a good book. Prime was like taking uh, Captain Marvel Shazam and putting it on his head. It was okay. Hardcore Steve Gerber fan from fan since reading Howard the Duck off the rack. Yeah, Von Chilla, man. Uh, I've got the uh, I got a ton of the Howard the Duck stuff, man. I remember those as a kid. Von Chilla, I, I, I don't know if you've heard me talk before and stuff, but uh, me starting out in comics was because my stepdad and uncle uh, in the late 70s, 1977, 78, had all this stuff laying around. So I started out with X-Men number three all the way to the Steve Gerber, Howard the Duck stuff, and Thor and Guardians of the Galaxy and things like that. Gerber and Kirby were my childhood. Yes, and that is a good childhood there, Matthew. All right, pick this up. Not a big deal, but this is Jim Lee's first uh, work at uh, Marvel, Alpha Flight 51. He went on to do a, a little story arc that I want to get uh, with the Dream Queen. I think it was in the late 50s. I uh, kind of want to check that out. Yeah, this Howard the Duck run completed. It's well worth doing it. I, I mean, uh, Von Chilla is here, uh, but I, I, if I'm remembering right, I think the first 22 issues or so were really the ones worth getting. Gerber stayed on there for a while, and I, I may do a whole video on the big drama with Howard the Duck and uh, the 70s and Steve Gerber's fight with uh, Kirby jumping in there with Destroyer Duck to get the rights back and some of the stuff that Gerber pulled. Yeah. All right, now, uh, a book that I want to try to be completing, this has an interesting uh, publishing history, right? This is James DeMontes, and um, oh my God, I can't remember, John Bolton maybe? This is from the 80s. This is from Marvel's Epic Line. And uh, I saw advertisements for this and always wanted to check it out. And I finally found a few uh, copies here. And it was really interesting is that Epic put it out in the 80s. And then Vertigo re-put out the 12 issues in the early 90s. And I would pick those up, but I didn't know they were the same thing. But it was Moonshadow. Beautiful painted comic uh, advertised as a fairy tale for adults. And I'm on this one just downright for the freaking um, art and the adults. I mean, look at this stuff. This is beautiful. And like I said, Vertigo ended up uh, putting this out as 12 issues also, which I always found interesting. So uh, I got one buddy who said he loved Moonshadow. I've never heard anybody else talk about it. So when I found those for a buck a piece, I jumped on board. Something really cool I found, if you remember Color Forms, oh, I don't know what Moonshadow is really about. Uh, I'm going to try to get a few more issues. Uh, she may be, and Matilda may be asking about Howard the Duck there, so somebody help her out. Um, so anyway, Worlds Comics, uh, this right here, yeah, Worlds Collide. This is where Milestone and DC had their big crossover. My, uh, Milestone was an imprint started by Dwayne McDuffie, Dennis Cohen, and a whole bunch of guys. That's where we got Static from and some other cool books and stuff. But what's really cool about this is this is Color Forms. This is a special book that came out. They had a Superman Man of Steel where you had Superman and Lobo with color forms. And this is the one where they did it with Milestone characters. And what this is, is this is a plastic cover that's got like a waxy feel to it. And you have these stickers that are plastic also that you can pull off and pull on. 
and create a scene on this. And I have a 1977 color form kits with the Super Friends, and I have it. Oh, I forgot all about Moon Shadow. That's what I do, Von Chilla. That's what I do. I find those gems out there and bring them out. I have little memories, saw little advertisements, read things. You're talking to a huge Atari Force fan here, man, which is a book that was much better than it should have been. Stuff like that. All right, man. Uh, something I got just because it cracked me up, man, was uh, Conan, the McFarlane cover, which I thought was cool. Uh, back in the day when Marvel originally had the license imprint and stuff, and they were bringing on some cover artists to try to pick the book up a little bit. And of course, McFarlane was hot from where he was coming on Spider-Man in 1988. He did Marvel Tales covers and everything like that. And for a while, if it had McFarlane on it, you grabbed it. And it always cracked me up that uh, the man with the super cartoony style came on the grim and gritty uh, Conan just for a cover. Uh, the World's Collide crossover was published here. They didn't publish Milestone, but they ran the crossover. Nice, nice. There's one more comment that'll pop up. Every time somebody, there we go. I'm old enough to have played with color forms. Yes, yes. I had the Kiss color forms too. I had a ton of them. Uh, yeah, the man, that's it. Uh, when, who said that? Mind the comics. Yes, the the Mighties, uh started a YouTube channel. The writer from comics and stuff, he started a YouTube channel. Um, I, sub, I subbed to it to a couple of days ago. Go check it out. All right, everybody's saying hello. All right, so with those Conan covers, I also picked these up. These are Conan McFarlane covers, Mr. Hellboy himself. And I'm pretty sure this is pre, um, I don't see a year on him. But anyway, this the, the, he just did the covers. He didn't do the, do the interiors, man. So yeah, what are color forms? Color forms is where you set your own scene. Back in the days when um, you had you, we used our imagination more for playing. We were a lot more creative and stuff. And basically, a color form is is that, think of it like a cartoon. You have a background. They'll give you a background. Now, the Kiss one that I, I can grab my super friends up here. The Kiss one was just like a street. Like, you would just see a couple buildings in the street. And then you have, like, these stickers you could peel off, and they were plastic. They looked like stickers, but they were just pieces of plastic. And they would be of the characters and of accessories. And you could stick them however you want. And it was like you making a comic book panel. Does that make sense? All right, I'm losing people here, so I'm moving on here. Um... I don't, what is this in here? Apparently, I picked up my DC Nation a couple months ago. Number zero. I haven't read it yet. Um, like I said, I might have shown some of the stuff before, but for a buck, um, I found the Incredible Hulk, Peter David, George Perez. Um, you have to see the color forms to understand. Reusable stickers, but not paper. Yeah. But anyway, this is uh, Future Perfect number one. Man, I've probably got like three sets of this. I might still have the trade. This is something I'm able to turn over, let people borrow, sell for cheap because it's so good. But basically, the Hulk gets pulled into a Mad Max world of the future. He time travels. He gets brought back by Rick Jones's granddaughter to fight the Maestro. And we find out that the Earth has had a nuclear war, and it made the Hulk even stronger. And he became the ruler of this world, and he is the Maestro. Ball on, on top, long beard, long, you know, kind of like a green uh, Santa Claus. And this is George Perez. The art in this is fantastic. We have Rick Jones still alive, and he's gone around, and he's found artifacts of the superheroes, costumes, iron pieces of Iron Man shell, a busted-up Silver Surfer board, and he's got, like, a room that would be, like, one of our comic book rooms where all this stuff is just hanging and organized and stuff. The saddest thing I saw was where they had uh, the fur. Somebody had skinned him, and they just kind of had it in a picture frame. It's one of those pages you can just sit there and just, like, Easter egg hunt through, right? Uh, picked up a few Swamp Thing, right? Um... I've had my, you know, Mind the Comics, Paulo Costa and I, and uh, Comic Crack. Uh, we've done two streams talking about Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. We're going to be doing another one. Uh, but I've kind of expanded there. Uh, I've, you know, I've had all the Alan Moore Swamp Things forever. I've got stuff signed by people that worked on the book, like John Tottlebaum and things like that. And then Rick Beitch took over, uh, and he found his footing real quick, which was, so, which was really good. And then you turn around and... Uh, that came on Nancy A. Collins, and all these people came on there. So I kind of like didn't really get a lot of that stuff past issue 100. Uh, Grant Morrison and Mark Miller came on there. So I'm kind of just going ahead and completing the 80s run from 19 to the last issue, you know. But uh, so I picked up two more issues of uh, this is the Grant Mor Mark Miller's run. Morrison came on, co plotted with him, and he took off. And they kind of like went back and sort of undid the Alan Moore stuff and started referencing it. And then Nancy A. Collins came on, 
and she was a great author. I mean, she actually published real books, if you get what I'm saying. And she came on here, and there's some, you know, her run's kind of acclaimed. I've never really read too much of it. Oh, and look what I was talking about. Here's Nightman. I got Nightman number one. Uh, like I said, it's sort of like uh, Shadow Man. Uh, Steve Englehart going to the Ultraverse here and going for what he wanted to do in the book, which was fantastic. And what was really cool about this is there was a month, Barry Winsler Smith, with the fallout of Valiant, after Shooter left and stuff, uh, Winsler Smith kind of started branching out and doing things. He did a book called Rune. Now, if you look on the top of these Valiant books, they had a month where you needed to look for the debut of Rune. Because what they did is they did it in chapters. Instead of giving a whole story, uh, each book flipped over for that month of the Ultraverse, and you'd get a corner of a panel. This is probably the upper right panel where we see his hand, Rune. Rune is a vampire who gets hit with a nuclear war, a nuclear nuclear blast back in the 40s or something like that. Uh, something happened. I mean, we're going way back now, but I loved Rune. Rensler Smith uh, did about six issues, I think, of the original series that came out. But they collected his origin, but he's telling his origin here. There we go. That shows you there were nine issues uh, and how they go together. But Rune has to eat, he, he's a vampire that has to drink the blood of people with superpowers. Um, and he's horrific. His jaw hinges like a snake. Uh, I mean, he's a horrific freaking vampire. And I think he gets powers and magic from runes and stuff. He's very old. Barry Winsler Smith that have one shot. Yeah, I remember the Nightman TV series. I took a page out of Manimal and was always repeated the same scene where Johnny Domino put on the uh, Nightman costume. Yeah, man, the 90s had a lot of really cool uh, syndicated shows, man, that, you know, I mean, I put Nightman up there with like Xena, Warrior Princes, and Hercules, and some of that stuff. Uh, yeah. What is the name? The name of what? What are you asking there, Matilda? Of the vampire Rune, R-U-N-E. Yeah, Rune. Uh, it's a really cool book, but Barry Windsor Smith returned to Conan in the 90s because Marvel did a one-shot where it was Rune meets um, Conan. They took it back to the Hyborian age, and they had Rune when he was just the monster vampire. Yeah, so it's good stuff. I highly recommend looking it up on the internet before you commit yourself to trying to track it down. You can probably get it on eBay. It should be cheap, you know. But they took all those issues that were on the flip books. Uh, can I write it, please? Let me see here. I tell you what, I'll uh, I'll figure out some way to. Yeah, there we go. They got it for you. Vincenzo, uh, Vincenzo uh, took care of you there. All right. Now moving on here. Uh, and speaking of Gerber again, um, I've got some books here, and I'm gonna go ahead and finish this run up. I'm so close to do it, and these books are actually so cheap to do it and stuff. But John Byrne came out the sensational She-Hulk when he was kind of leaving dc after spending years doing an amazing amazing things with superman uh you know worked he was a workhorse there and did all sorts of things and stuff right and he comes on sensational she hulk and he, he has the character breaking the fourth wall i mean if you like deadpool you need to check out sensational she hulk and ambush bug because that's where it all kind of came from but uh steve gerber ended up coming on uh they had some filling issues with some writers after john Byrne left this series uh, and Steve Gerber came on, and he ended up uh, doing the Sensational She-Hulk for a while, and he pulled in Howard the Duck for you guys, right? Um, so like I said, there was a few fill-in issues. Steve Gerber came on. I think Peter David did an issue. You know, I got to go back and read these. I didn't really follow the series until Byrne came back with issue 31. So from issue 9 to 30, and kind of iffy. But Gerber came on, and he started his thing with, uh, you know, talking about comics and and things like that, and on the way Steve Gerber could, very symbolically. Oh, got a message there. Uh, and then, um, yeah, this is uh, one of the Peter David issues, not a big deal. But anyway, Gerber came on there, and we got our Howard the Duck. Howard the Duck was in the book for a while, and Gerber was doing his thing, right? Uh, and then they started getting Dale Keown to come on and do covers and stuff, you know, kind of really saving the book. I think the, you know, editors were like, we can't let this go. She-Hulk uh, has a, had a huge following. You know, I just realized that they ended up really doing this with the She-Hulk, didn't they? In a joke book, they turned her into a freaking, I don't know what this is. Uh, they turned her into that. So, yeah, I'm kind of, you know, that's why I don't follow current Marvel. When She-Hulk was great. That's right, Lou. That's right, Lou. This is it. So, yeah, so uh, just some good stuff here. I don't know how long Gerber stayed on here, but 
uh, one of my favorite little stories he did is that he brought in, I'll show it to you in a minute, man, but he, he kind of threw She-Hulk into the Batman universe. Like if the Batman universe existed in an asylum, Matt, you need to read the American Vampire comic book series. Yeah, here's one with Doctor Doom's nephew or something. I mean, there's a lot of funny stuff in there. But uh, issue 19 and 20, I have 20 put up somewhere. But if you read two issues out of Steve Gerber's run, I highly recommend issue 19 and 20 because it's a spoof on the Batman universe if it existed in Asylum. It actually took me back to a Guardians of the Galaxy story that Gerber did uh, back in the 70s where they landed on a planet that looked like Earth and it was full of aliens and looked like New York in the 1970s. And the Guardians of the Galaxy end up finding out that it's a asylum planet. And they asked the 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 gate the caretakers of the planet, why did you make it look like Earth in the 70s? He's like, we didn't, they did. You know, so the the you know the you know the uh <laughs> the inmates made it look like that. Which uh, from what I heard, Gerber hated New York back in the day. So those are two good books. Yeah. Uh yeah, going on and on and on. Yeah, I don't have a lot to comment here. Blonde Phantom, and they brought in Death's Head. And I have a buddy who is a huge Death Heads uh, 2 fan, right? Uh, that's a, I think it's a UK character, a Death Head. I remember him being kind of hot, but, uh, you know, I'm a Judge Dredd guy and stuff, right? So, uh, real quick, I ended up going to uh, a Goodwill looking for books. I didn't know who wrote some sheet. Yeah, Von Chile. Yeah. Uh, look it up online. Uh, I mean, if you're a Gerber fan, look it up. If you're a Howard Duck completist, look it up. It's Gerber. I mean, it's Gerber. Uh, good stuff, man. All right. So just to kind of wind this up here with some uh, movies and stuff, went to the Goodwill. Went yesterday. I don't usually spend this much at the Goodwill. It's the Goodwill. Uh, UK character, Death's Head, along with Dragon's Claws. Yes, yes. Yeah, Lou, uh, I really don't know a lot about those characters. I'm familiar with them. I remember seeing the covers. I remember seeing them for sale. I remember seeing some advertisements. I never really jumped in on there, man. And I actually think that stuff started coming out when I got married the first time. I don't know. The first time. The only time. Okay. So I went to the Goodwill and stuff. And I go to Goodwill and, you know, I, I need to draw She-Hulk. Yes, you do, Matilda. Draw that She-Hulk. She's awesome. All right. So I've ended up getting some movies there, right? I don't usually spend this much on movies. I get 50 cents VHS, VHS. Um, DVDs are usually, uh, you know, like 250 and I look around for a few things. Yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry, guys. I had a message here. It'll, there we go. So anyway, I get out there and I found some good stuff, man, for 250. Some of these weren't even open, so I could not pass them up. This is probably the most I've ever spent at a Goodwill at one time. All right. But uh, The Magnificent Seven. The, the the from 1960 with Steve McQueen, Yul Brenner, and stuff like that. Finally got to watch this last night. It dawned on me I've never sat and watched the whole movie. And for you, and I got told, um, I you envy my stores. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I finally watched this and stuff. And this is a Western remake of Seven Samurai. Funnily enough, I saw Seven Samurai when I was like 12 years old. It may, it may be one of the first movies I actually set through with subtitles, if I'm remembering right, right. So this thing was freaking cool. Steve McQueen and all that stuff. I mean, who isn't a Steve McQueen fan? You know, anyway, if you know who he is. So anyway, I finally got to kind of watch this. And I got told there was a remake with Chris Pratt and Morgan Freeman and a bunch of people a few years ago. We don't have those in Israel. Oh, wow. Well, thank you for watching me from uh, literally halfway around the world here, man, Matilda. That's awesome. Um, Boris Karloff, the Frankenstein collection. Um, four or five movies of uh, the universal frankenstein we have frankenstein bride of frankenstein son of frankenstein ghost of frankenstein house of frankenstein um i used to have all of these back in the day but sold them in the 2000s so i need to get the werewolf collection i got the creature from the black lagoon um yeah fantastic movie thanks yes it is yes it is but i love the universal monsters ones monster ones the universal monster movies the black and white ones even when they started getting cheesy in the 40s Two of my favorites are Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein because it has Frankenstein, Dracula, uh, all of them in there. And it's Lon Chaney. And I want to say Bo uh, Lon Chaney and here I go, man, going blank. I'm just going to not embarrass myself. It's uh, me and my coffee here. Uh, and the other one is I love the movie Frankenstein versus the werewolf. Uh, it's so actually funny because by the time they meet at the end of the movie, uh, you're either going to love it or you're going to feel jipped. It was a uh, fantastic they didn't have blueprints for this stuff back then they were doing it as they went along 
a movie I've only seen the end of. I saw the end of this in the 90s, and I need to go back and finally really watch the whole movie. But The Unforgiven, uh, Morgan Freeman, Gene Hackman, Clint Eastwood. I think two bounty hunters or something come out of retirement. The Tom Cruise mummy remake was meant to relaunch the Universal franchise, and it bombed. I hated the Van Helsing movie, and I'm just going to leave it at that. They made the guy look like, uh, they made Hugh Jackman look like Vampire Hunter D, and it didn't feel like a horror movie. It didn't feel like our monster movies in the Universal world. It was like bad sci-fi. <laughs> anyway, so, but The Unforgiven, man, but I saw the end of this, uh, and I love the ending. You know, it's Clint Eastwood and stuff. So, but anyway, two bounty hunters come out of retirement to track down some ex-prostitute or something in the West. I don't know what the big deal is, but I can't wait to watch it to see what it is, you know which is fantastic uh you guys may not get this or not this is brand new i had to get this john c Riley sings a song in this i love called mr cellophane but this is chicago a musical from the early 2000s unforgiven is awesome uh lou if you're giving it a big thumbs up i am so down i mean it's clint eastwood you know western you can't go wrong um but anyway i got this uh, i'm not gonna talk a lot about this um okay and then I got this, and I don't care. I, I take flack for it, and I don't care, man. I like the Bee Gees, okay? Sign of Frankenstein was a blazing performance by Bella Lugosi as Weigar, his best work. All right, Von Chilla, I can tell we could talk movies there and stuff. I was going blank on Bella Lugosi of all freaking names, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I said, I love all those movies. I really do, man. Okay, but I'm one of the guys, man. I'm a big punk metalhead, right? Listen to alt music. I'm a huge Motown fan and all this stuff, and I just don't get why the Bee Gees. I, I remember the radio days when I was a kid getting drove around, and I remember the freaking radio station saying, come listen to us. It's a no BG weekend. We promise not to play no Bee Gees. So whatever was going on, there you go. You know what I'm saying? But uh, this is uh, the Bee Gees doing Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band when they do a bunch of, uh, they have a storyline. They do, they play some um, Beatles songs and stuff in there. There's uh, other people on here. I have the album here, but we have Aerosmith in this. Um, you know, all these people came together and were doing Beatles songs that went with the storyline. George Burns hosts it, narrates it, and he speaks over everybody's lines as they kind of lip sync. You have to watch it to figure it out because, you know, they can't act. Uh, Unforgiven is my favorite Eastwood film. Chicago is an immensely entertaining film. Thank you, Von Chilla. Chicago is a fun film. Yes. Oh, man, finally. Uh, but I love, but this thing got panned and I loved it. I remember watching this on Showtime when I was like six or seven. I've loved it. I have it on VHS, but I finally have it. I have the soundtrack on vinyl, but I can't remember the lady's name, but there's a lady that sings, um, I want, is it Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds or Strawberry Fields? But it's freaking beautiful. Um, I'm probably going to like pull it up after this is over with. And I cannot believe this. I had this on VHS. I always put off getting these things on DVD, but Unopened, brand practically brand new, two dollars and fifty cents. The Beatles' "Yellow Submarine" digitally remastered. Um, this isn't for everybody. It's very trippy. It's very bright, very colorful. No doubt in my mind, it was you know the drug era. You know what I mean? Uh, the Cell Block Tango. They had it coming. <laughs> oh man! All right, I'm trying to get my comments up there, man. But that's practically it, man. Now, the big question I have for you guys, let's see, the Cell Block Tango, the uh, Yagor actually played a pretty large part in the film, Lugosi was incredible. Hey, comics are us from England, man, Israel, England, Lou, Ireland, 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 Scotland, or something, everybody, this is great, you know, I love when people come in and hear where they're from. Well, guys, I, I want to do a Q&A here if anybody wants, I mean, that's, that's the haul, don't want to drag this out, we got things to do, I might do another live stream, but... Uh, Yellow Submarine just freaked me out when I was young. Yeah, the blue mean, the finger got me. I thought it was so cool to have the finger. And then I was reading Doom Patrol by Grant Morrison, and they got a guy named the Love Glove. And that guy felt like he was mod and everything, and I feel like he should have been a character in Yellow Submarine. But the blue meanies cracked me up. In the 90s, uh, ECW Wrestling had a con character come out, a wrestler who was the blue meal. Beatles forever. you damn straight, man. Yep. Beatles forever, man. When I talk about the 60s uh, music and stuff, um, when I talk about the 60s music and stuff, it's really interesting because, like, I love The Who, okay? I love The Who. Uh, you know, I dig The Stones and all that stuff, and I can really kind of get in there because I kind of grew up listening to it. You know, my family were of the 60s and grew up. Uh, my parents were very young, 
So it was sort of like we kind of grew up together, listening to their music and stuff. But it's so funny. I automatically say that the Beatles is the band that cannot be beat in the 60s. Okay. And then it's like, after I put them over there, it's like I talk about all these other bands and I exclude the Beatles because they're up here. You know what I mean? It's just, oh my God. Um, oh, I saw a face. Um, yeah, Morrison's Doom Patrol is definitely underrated, man. Like, uh, you know, I'm going to have to break down and finally try to do a video. It is so hard to do Grant Morrison reviews and books justice because it's so intertwined. It, you really have to immerse yourself in that. But when it comes to the Beatles, I love uh, Dear Prudence may very well be my most favorite Beatles song. I saw a face. I love that. And then this revolver, you know, just revolver. A lot of people talk about Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which is fantastic. But revolver. Yeah, but Grant Morrison's Doom Patrol run, he pulls from so much stuff that, uh, and supposedly, you know, he claims he did drugs to get a psychedelic feel. Howler Mouse, what does that channel name mean? Howler Mouse is uh, simply my nickname. It's got a, I, I actually did a video about the origin of the Howler Mouse name, but I've been Howler Mouse since the 90s, pre-internet, uh, basically because I worked a job in a group home and I did a night shift and in the night shift you would wax floors and all this stuff and check new bed counts and all kinds of things but they had satellite and a National Geographic show came on and they showed something called a grasshopper mouse. A grasshopper mouse runs around the desert or something like that and looks like a little house mouse but it has the characteristics of a wolf. It, it runs through there and it eats spiders and fights scorpions. It's a meat eater and it will get on a rock and squeak at the moon. Well, where it was two, three o'clock in the morning and I was exhausted, I thought they called it a howler mouse. And it turns out it was a grasshopper mouse. And I had tons of my friends and I were trying to find this mouse that I misnamed uh, for years. And when I found out what it was, I didn't tell them. So people started calling me howler. They would just want to see this mouse that acted like a wolf. They got infatuated. So people started, they would always talk to me about it. They, you know, if I ever found, they would ask over the years if I found it and things like that. And then there's like another little story. It's too personal to tell uh, about where it really stuck. So yeah, I was howler for years before internet even came. Did third, third shift for years. I like the nightlife. Yep. Crawling from the records has first four issues as compared to Moore's anatomy lesson, the swamp thing. It was really, yeah. Crawling from the records uh, was really a deconstruction of what had come before that. And Morrison let you know that we're going places. Now, Arnold Drake, the creator, I think it was Arnold Drake, the creator of Zoom Patrol, said that uh he gave it a he gave it a huge approval he said grant morrison finally made that book as weird as he wanted it to make it he finally did everything with doom patrol that arnold Grant wanted to do it and while a lot of people don't know about the doom patrol is that the same guy that created guardians of the galaxy created doom patrol is all arnold drake arnold drake is like the most one of the one of many of the most underrated uh silver age creators ever in my opinion considering what little work he did and how much came out of it. Um, you know, um, you know, a lot of people couldn't get out from under the shadow of Kirby and Ditko and uh, Lee and, you know, all, you know, you know the names, but there's a lot of other people there that had some really cool creations. Um, Arnold Drake to me is really underrated. Uh, Basil Wolverton, uh, if you guys ever heard of him from the 40s and 50s and stuff. Yeah. Drake, another 60s unsung hero. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I don't feel like the guy ever got screwed or anything. I've never really looked up his bio to see what else he had done and where his career went didn't go. But as you get older and you start connecting dots with this hobby and start recognizing names and stuff, you're like, son of a bitch. You got this, and you got this, and you got this. And Arnold Drake is one of those guys. Ramona Frandon. I don't know why more people don't talk about Ramona, you know, for the freaking glass ceiling she broke and stuff. Creator of Metamorpho and stuff. But there's a lot of those Silver Age books that, I mean, I'm just glad that they have survived and people get them. Animal Man, Metamorpho, uh, Doom Patrol. Uh, I would love to see, uh, I would love to get some Sea Devils because of the fantastic artwork, art, art work that were on those books. Uh, and, you know, it's one of those things where I can go down a rabbit hole if I don't watch guys, you know, <laughs> and I'll be, they'll be like, what the hell is he talking about? And it's all making sense in my head. All right, guys. 15 people are still sticking around. We're 40 minutes into it, man. We'll do a quick Q&A if anybody does have any uh, questions. Yeah, Lou's talking about he's still sad over Ditko's passing. It's sad, but the man made it into his 90s. Um, 
he screwed himself out of a lot of money. I mean, let's just get that out of the way with the Spider-Man and things because he had this sense of right and wrong, which you can talk about all day long with his beliefs and stuff. But the guy created comics, you know, all the way up until like, you know, the day he died out of his little studio. He just put out some new Mr. A stuff. And what's wild is that it's real different than Alex Toth dying and a few of these other guys, Kirby dying and things like that. You know, Ditko worked, made a legacy stuck by his guns, made it into his 90s. I mean, I'm, I think it's more of a man who had a, a freaking work life well spent. You know, I feel like that guy stuck to his guns, did everything. It's really odd about his passing. It's more inspiring than anything. The guy worked to the, the fact that he worked to the end. You know what I mean? And he influenced uh, Alan Moore. He, he did Spider-Man, Creeper, Hawk and Dove. Do I draw comics? Uh, I'm an artist. I draw a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually starting to think about doing some videos where I show some art. I mean, I'm self-taught. Uh, I actually taught a few classes back when I was like 18 or 19, got published a little bit in local newspapers. Uh, but I really never had the, I never really wanted to make a career out of it too much. I used to do windows and acrylic for stores for Halloween and holidays and stuff. And I made $178 in six months. I'm like, I can't make a living at this around here. So you didn't really know where to go or anything like that. All right. I saw some comments there, man. I won't, they won't come up. Here we go. Uh, do you have any of his later stuff? Uh, hard to get in the UK. Got to go to the livestock. Great stream. See you later. Thanks, Von Chilla. Uh, do I have some... Um, I've seen it. I got a buddy who actually was on a mailing list or something out of Ditko's studio or something. Now, so I do have a buddy that's got some of his later Mr. A stuff, and I might have one or two issues. I got inspired to draw comics after watching a video of yours. Oh, man, that's awesome. Thanks. Let me get this out of the way. Couldn't see who did that. I'm getting messages from people in real life, and I'm getting all kinds of little avatars across my screen here. But, uh, oh, man, that's great. Yeah, jump in there and, uh, you know, just do it. It came out bad. No such thing, man. I know such thing. No such thing, Matilda. Uh, I know you're being critical yourself, but that just shows you have the heart of an artist because in truth, in my experience and with myself, uh, an artist's hardest critic is their selves. So if you're sitting there looking at something that looks like crap, uh, that means there's something in there and you want to do better and you want to be a perfectionist with it and stuff. So jump in there. But what's cool about comic book art that people don't really talk about, and I about flipped out when I saw Alex Ross reference it because I'd heard it before. It's old school stuff. These guys had deadlines. These guys were putting out 20 pages a month, right? Artists on a comic book drawing. You know what I mean? And there's an energy about when you just lay down and you don't overthink your work and you're trying to get it out. Comic books had this energy from doing that and that's the trick some artists will get up there and and here in alex ross who does photo realistic paintings and stuff with with watercolor and go gooch gouch gooch anyway you know some all some all kinds of uh, mediums and stuff like that for him to pick up on the way to get a comic book energy you have to be quick and overthink it is amazing because he has to spend a lot of time on his work so that was just amazing so stick to it man that the if, if you're drawing comics or anything like that I highly recommend um, life drawing. Get like a little, get some paper, whatever it is, go outside and just draw whatever you see. Anything that catches your eye, anything, you know. Because a lot of comic book artists and stuff like that will get used to get with a writer and the writer would flat out ask them, what do you like to draw? What not, what do you not like to draw? And it would make, it would inspire the writer. That's how some of these stories came up. You know, he doesn't like drawing cars. So we're gonna put it in space where there's no cars. All right, guys, I think we're good here. I have some phone calls to make. Monsters are awesome, man. That's where Hellboy came from, Matilda. Uh, Mike Magnolia, his, his whole goal in comics is that he wanted to draw just monsters. He wanted a book where monsters were fighting monsters, and that's where Hellboy came from. <coughs> and he felt like mission accomplished when he was able to make a living just drawing Hellboy before it turned in huge in Japan and we got the movies and things like that. So, yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Draw what you like. Draw what you want. It's awesome. You know, challenge yourself. Don't get stale. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to say, man. Just uh, don't feel insecure about it. It seems like every comic book reader is a closet comic book writer or artist. I know my childhood friends, and I want to create our own. That's the thing with comic books. Now we got something I want to be talking about. I might do this whole other freaking topic in a video and stuff like that. 
I grew up in the 70s, and you're probably going to hear this reference before because I know I'm not the one coming up with it. It's just stuck in my head, but it's perfect. Okay, Kiss. Kiss was huge with the makeup. Ace Frehley, Peter Chris, Gene Simmons, uh, Paul Stanley. You had you had color forms coming out of Kiss, I mentioned before. You had uh, the makeup. You had the, their, their, their dolls. They, they were posters everywhere, right? And everybody was, you know, kind of getting a guitar. But and, and their merchandising was huge. I had the Kiss trading cards. They were in my house. You know? uh, the, the, my stepdad had all of their freaking posters just like wallpapered around his bedroom wall and all this stuff, right? And then you had like the Ramones, somebody I didn't catch till later. I heard their songs like uh, Teenage Lobotomy and Blitzkrieg Bop here and there, but you know, I'm a little kid and it was few, it was rare, rare to even hear them, right? But the people like Kiss would go out and buy guitars and eventually those guitars are collecting dust. People who used listen to the Ramones with three chords and it was raw and everything like that, futuristic sounding at the time, they ended up becoming bands. They ended up going in making actual bands after they saw them in performance. And that's what the, the that's what the comic books do, man. The comic books make you want to write. They make you want to draw. You love that character. You're sitting there. You're tracing. You're opening it up. I can mimic Mike Magnolia's style. You play Mike Magnolia beside of me, and I can almost reproduce it exactly with what he is. I can't do the ink in, in the brushes he does. You know which band had great visuals for comic book? Africa, Mombasta, and the Soul Sonic Force. Never heard of them. I'm a child of the 90s. Starman. Oh, those will come. Those comments will come back it's just awesome to sit here and read a comment and watch it fade away before you're done lou i never heard of that band but i definitely want to see them i'm glad the live streams keep the comments up so i can find it but that's the thing about comic books man it inspires you and, and things like that that's why i like in the late 60s when you had lynn wine um you know what you mean oh that's paulo that said that paulo yeah africa my best is the grandfather of hip-hop i'm definitely going to check that out Four-part series of Titan comics based on The Prisoner by Pete Milligan. Got it, Lou. I've got The Prisoner comic book you're talking about. Paulo, I definitely am going to check out that band. But, uh, yeah, that's the thing about comic books. That's how I started drawing. I started drawing. Charles Schultz was the first comic book strip and stuff that I drew. I drew Charlie Brown everywhere all the time. I mean, we're talking four, five, six years old. Moved on to comics, and it was, of course, it was probably like Batman and Superman. And then I remember when I was eight years old, I came up with all these Batman costumes. In 1981, when I'm eight years old, I had Batman in a white Batman outfit, little spots of black in here, and I gave him a goatee. You know, well, Van Dyke. Goatee is just the beard. But when you had the mustache, it's a Van Dyke. So I had Batman in that, and I'm always sitting here cringing, waiting for somebody to give Batman a goatee. And I'm going to be like, I did it in 1981 when I was a kid. You owe me money. But yeah, comic books inspired me, man. I've got art books here and stuff. I've got all my supplies down here and some other things. And, you know, I've, I've so, in high school, I would get heavy metal magazines like Circus and stuff that would have the hair bands. You could have the posters and stuff. And I would get some chalk pastel from school. And I would sit there and I would draw Brett Michaels, Cinderella, Guns N' Roses and stuff. I'm creating a series of stories involving uh, Mothman. And it's inspired by X-Files. That's awesome, man. But be careful. Steve Rude has a book called Mothman. And I think that dude's a masked wrestler turned into a hero or something. So check it out. Uh, it's a hero inspired by X-Files and Starman. Cool. And Matilda says, I have an art teacher. Cool. Awesome, man. Nice. That's awesome. Man, we're getting some, a lot of comments here and stuff, man. But um, oh, I lost my train of thought. I think I was talking about art and stuff like that. But yeah, yeah, uh, that's the great thing about comics, man. It, it excites people. It's kids. It's one thing to sit down and read. It's another thing to get up and do. And that's what comics can used to do for you as a kid. And as you, you know, you would read the stuff and you would jump up and and just have this energy that you just had to get out. And you, I love things that create. I mean, uh, art is art. There's a channel I watch that you guys might want to check out called Pete Draws. Good stuff. You guys got a wicked sense of humor. Uh, yes, Matthew, I want to be linked by your Mothman store if you want. Come in after this thing uploads and feel free to put the freaking link in the real comments so people can see them. Uh, totally plug your stuff. Yes, I want to see it. Love that stuff. Um, I like when comics come from a grassroots place. You know what I mean? Uh, the stuff we're getting today, I can sit here. I, I really want to be positive. So anything like that, let's get it out there. Yeah, definitely. All right, man. Guys, I do have to go. Thumbs this up. Share it. I may be back today. 
and feel free to leave comments about any topics you want me to talk about and stuff like that. Um, maybe maybe I'll do a, a video or a stream about uh, you know how comics inspire you to be creative. I mean, we got a Mothman comic coming out here. We got Matilda halfway around the world from where I'm at, you know, in the art, uh, passing to Steve Ditko. Everybody's so inspired. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Be sure to link that up. Like, sub, subscribe, tell all your friends, thumb it up. Let's I'm, get this channel going again. Yeah, thanks, guys. Nice, man. Thanks. Later, guys.